What makes pride? We've been taught that pride is sinful, selfish, arrogant, deadly, but we know better. Pride is not deadly, hate is. Hate is the violence trying to make us small, silent, invisible, extinct. Pride is the extravagant, unapologetic embrace of our wholeness. Pride is the affirmation of our humanity. Pride announces we are here on our own terms. And for pride to be real, it must confront all the hate that seeks to destroy. Pride must battle white supremacy. It must end poverty. It must uproot patriarchy. Pride must liberate, house, clothe, and build. I am Melissa Harris Perry, and this month I'm partnering with PFLAG, the nation's largest family and ally organization, to lead a series of conversations with BIPOC, queer, and trans folk who are organizing transformational work in our communities. Join us every Tuesday in the month of June on PFLAG.org. Welcome. I'm Melissa Harris Perry, and I'm your host this month for a series of conversations we're calling What Makes Pride? Each week during the month of June, I will be joined by leaders who are tackling critical issues facing BIPOC, queer, and trans communities through advocacy, activism, arts, and we're going to call it creative maladjustment. And here to kick off our What Makes Pride series is movement veteran of the intersections, Earl Folks. Earl is the president and CEO of the Center for Black Equity. And the Center for Black Equity improves the lives of Black LGBTQ plus people globally by working to advance social, economic, and health equity. Earl, thank you for joining me. It's really my pleasure to be part of this historic and enlightening uh, series. I'm really excited about it. So Earl, let's just start with, we're gonna be doing a whole month of conversations. But can you lay out for me, what are the most pressing issues currently facing BIPOC, queer, and trans communities? Well, I think one of the most pressing issues is the fact that we're in trauma. COVID-19 has traumatized our community and traumatized the world globally, and it's still traumatizing huge swath of uh, the world, you know, Brazil, uh, India, uh, Ghana, um, Nigeria. And so that's probably one of the greatest issues and and because of the trauma we have to deal with increased mental health issues increased substance use issues increase in, uh, increased uh, alcoholism increased domestic violence or increased homelessness increased food insecurity um, economic despair this uh, this covid-19 has exposed all of our inefficiencies of how we deal with each other and, and how our, our culture treats our people and it's um it's 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 actually kind of frightening on one hand. On the other hand, it's, it, it's, it's highlights a lot of the issues that many of us have been working on and we people are responding to them in a positive way. So there's good and bad. So I want to um, I want to dig into this idea of the intersections, because obviously, you know, 2020 into 2021 has been dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic. But the other critical piece of what has happened over the course of the past year has been the renewed, maybe we'd call it second wave of the movement for Black lives. Um, and of course, you know, last summer around this time, they've really mm. intersected in these critical ways. So I'm, I'm thinking about the work that you've done for decades. And Talk to me a little bit about the challenges um, or the opportunities of building coalition across these multiple identities, across the broad spectrum that is LGBTQ plus IA folk and Black folk, um, who do, of course, obviously exist at an intersection, but where sometimes like the organizing work or the policy discourse, you know, behaves as though we're separate communities. Well, you know, that's a very, very good question. That's one that um, it impacts me deeply. The fact is, the first, the first step is people have to realize that they're being oppressed. People have to realize that they are uh, under the heel of the boot of, of the society. People have to realize that there are a lot of people who don't understand us and don't like us. And this country has 400 years of, of anti-Black um, behavior and you don't overcome that in a couple of years. You don't overcome that with a, a year of demonstrations. It has to take a commitment, not from the people who are suffering, but from the people who have caused the suffering. 
And I think uh, the, what happened last year was a recognition by many people who are who are not black that there's something wrong with this country and that things need to be changed. And that's where I would start is the acknowledging is in educating our folks about the inequalities. There's no one should live in a food desert. You know, no one should live in a, in a substandard housing with, with vermin and, 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 you know, not running water or no one should go to schools that are poorly um, equipped uh, or the teachers don't care or the, the school uh, administrators don't care. Um, these are these are sub supplement. These are I should say. It's 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 actually it's funny. Uh, I feel like I'm feeling more emotional than I thought I would talking about this mm -hmm. because you're causing me to look at the big picture, and the big picture is not pretty. And and people need to acknowledge that that we have fundamental inequalities in our country towards women, towards black folks, towards the, the queer community, and we need to acknowledge that so we can address it. Let me just come to this kind of last question then. So this is Pride Month. Um, and again, if we're thinking about this intersection between blackness and queer and trans identity, pride has been central to both, right? I'm black and I'm mm -hmm. proud, right? has been part of our organizing. Also the idea of uh, gay pride, queer pride. So tell me something you're proud of. I know you said the big picture isn't pretty, but you've been in this struggle for a minute. What are you proud of that's different today um, than when you first started this work? I am proud of, and I, I'm one of the great instant gratifications I, I receive when I go to prides, and I've been to probably about 300 prides all over around the world of all kinds of prides in, in black, Latino, European, uh, you know, all over the place. I've been to thousands, hundreds to hundreds of prides and met thousands of people. Pride is. Pride Month is like uh, a freshman class in college. It, you know, there's always this influx of new people who are coming in, who are going to bring along the tradition, maybe change the, uh, uh, the, the, the whatever the tradition of this university or college is, uh, but they they bring it, infuse a new energy. And every year at Pride Month, you see people who are coming out for the first time. If I had a dollar for everybody who said that when they came to Black Pride or in, in Community Pride. And they came home and they told their family, they told their coworkers or their classmates or their friends, I would be a, a zillionaire. I could, I would, I'd be able to fund all the prides in the world. The fact of the matter is, is that there's always new people coming into the experience and they bring their own energy and they bring their own skill sets and they bring their own um, definition of what pride is. And I've witnessed this year after year after year after year after year. And it, 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 it inspires me to continue to do the work. I love that. And you got me right in my college professor heart with that uh, <laughs> analogy to, to a freshman class. There is, I We just had our pomp and circumstance graduations, but there is nothing I love like, uh, you know, those brand new freshmen uh, arriving on campus as first year students and, yeah. um, and, and about to take that journey of self-discovery. And it's a nice analogy in a lot of ways, because ideally, right, as you uh, graduate, you never really leave, um, right. and you, but you always become sort of more fully yourself if you're if you're doing it right. Earl Folks, thank you so much um, for taking the time. Earl Folks, president of the Center for Black Equity, thank you for joining me and for helping us to launch the What Makes Pride series. This is my pleasure, definitely my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. This week, we're discussing family. But before we meet our guests, I want you to pause and to think a little bit about the idea of family. Let's do it this way. Can you remember the first books that were read to you as a child? Or maybe you remember the first books that you read for yourself. Can you remember sounding out the letters, discovering punctuation, <laughs> suddenly realizing that all those marks and squiggles on the page had meaning, that they told a story? Mm, it's pretty exciting stuff. Now pause for a moment and try to recall what lessons you learned from those stories about the idea of family. <laughs> now, if you are like far too many of us, then your early books probably presented and reinforced very narrow definitions of family. Very likely, everyone in the storybook family shared the same race, ethnicity, and language. Very likely, the storybook family was headed by two adults, one man, one woman, and they were married to each other. Very likely, the children in the storybook family were the biological children of the married man and woman. 
Mother and sister wore pretty dresses and father and brother wore sensible slacks. Baby was wrapped in a blanket, blue for boys and pink for girls. And they all lived together in one house and that house had a yard. And sometimes there was a dog in the yard. But for so many of us, this storybook version of family bore little resemblance to our own families. People in our families were from many racial and ethnic backgrounds. They spoke many languages. Aunties and abuelas cared for us in the afternoon. And it wasn't clear whether these tias and grandmas were actually related to us by blood. We didn't have someone to call mom, but we had two loving dads. Brother painted his nails bright red and sister wore baggy jeans and a baseball cap every day. We had no house or yard or even a room to ourselves, but we knew that a hideaway sofa bed could easily accommodate three kids. It is difficult to overstate the harm that our culture perpetuates by its exceedingly narrow representations of family. Norms of gender identity, gender roles, heterosexuality, matrimonial imperatives, compulsory biological reproduction, and of course, middle-class consumption. They're all baked into that one central organizing social principle, family. And at the same time, it's difficult to overstate the life-giving liberation power that occurs when we discard the storybook and embrace the lived reality of family. When we queer family, we do much more than mitigate harm. We actually create new possibilities for human flourishing. Queering family means we actively resist messages about what counts as normal. Queering family means we refuse to accept erasure or invisibility for those we love. And queering family means we question dominant assumptions about parenting and partnering. Queering family means we lovingly interrogate ourselves and openly embrace others. Queering family means unleashing love and all of its world-changing power. To talk about what these principles look like in practice, I'm joined now by two members of the PFLAG family to discuss straight parents supporting their queer and trans kids at the intersection of Black and Latinx identities. Gisela Sesney is a board member of PFLAG Los Angeles chapter and a self-described activist mom. Gisela has been at the forefront of the PFLAG in Espanol effort. And also joining us is Robert Marchman. Robert is a board member of PFLAG's national organizing body. And at his day job, he serves as senior policy advisor on diversity and inclusion within the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission's Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. Thank you both for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, Jilla, I would like to start with you and um, your work around um, PFLAG in Espanol. So just in the most basic way, why does it matter? Why is that work at that particular intersection critical to family? When I realized that my kid was dating Latinx kids whose parents were in the closet, did not accept their child's sexual orientation or gender expression, I thought that I needed to make sure that, that my kids' future partners, families, were part of the PFLAG family. So it was simple as that. I love that. It's, it's you know, so much of our activism actually starts in that um, sort of initial moment of family. And yet I'll also say that as I was kind of roaming around on the internet looking for um, some of the work that you've done, I came across a 2020 um, video that you did with PFLAG about your reasons for voting. And part of what I loved about that is so often when we think about family, we think of it as an entirely private matter, but you actually made a, a, an explanation for why it's also a social and political responsibility. Yes, you know, for me, it's really important that we um, advocate for our children and our families. And I definitely want to make sure that everyone votes for people who see and love our children as we do. 
Robert, in the work that you do professionally, your work is connected to these issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm interested in um, sort of if we if we were imagining chickens and eggs, sort of um, was uh, was that work already sort of your agenda item professionally, and then um, you were living this particular um, positionality of diversity. Or is it in part that the professional work is spoken to by the family work? Well, the the, um, the work actually goes back a number of years. I've been doing diversity and inclusion work for over 25 years. And um, the, the um, had been doing diversity and inclusion work. And uh, actually... It was uh, the work I was doing was reinforced when my son came out, and um, and actually uh, because of the the work that I had been doing and also just uh, understanding um, who I am in this society and the importance of acceptance um, led us to actually um, be able to openly embrace our son. Uh, with without uh, a lot of the negative stories that you hear. And family is critically important to me. I know we're going to talk about allyship, but in I will just say in the business world, professional world, it's particularly important because um, from just my 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 home and understanding the connection um, in the business place uh, with the different organizations that I've worked with, we want to create an environment where people feel comfortable bringing their authentic self to work. And why is that important? That's important because if, if as a, we're all human beings, if you don't feel comfortable in an environment of being able to reveal who you are, that's going to have an impact on your ability to perform. And it's going to have an, it's going to have an impact on um, outcomes. So whether we're talking the business world, whether we're talking community or some of the other issues we, we're, you know, we're, we're going to talk about, it's critically important to recognize the value that we all bring, the dignity that we have as human beings. And you know, the, that, um, at the, the, that situation, the ability to have an understanding actually has helped me in the workplace be an ally in a number of different situations. Uh, for example, uh, when I worked in one organization uh, advocating for uh, the implementation of a pride employee affinity group or resource group and explaining to the chairman why that was important, right? Because of my personal experiences. So the personal experiences do interrelate to the work that, that I do. Um, and I, you know, I'm better off for it. And I think the organizations that I work for are better off for it as well. Not hard to convince me as an intersectional Black feminist that the personal is political for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Gisela, I'm interested, if we go back for a moment to you talking about the, the partners that your um, child will have in the future and, and your desire to, to be a, a space of, of advocacy and of understanding, how and when did you first find PFLAG? Um, how and you know what? Um, I've always known the word P flag. I, I couldn't mm. tell you when I first heard it, but I've always known of it. And that's part, part of the, well, that's the big part of the reason that I do this volunteer work because I don't want to know, I want that word P flag to be in everyone's mind when their child comes out. Um, but when my kid, uh, first, uh, talked about their sexual orientation to me, it was around puberty. That was when um, they came to me and I realized I had a lot of internalized homophobia. I was shocked at myself because I thought I was a liberal person, but you know, they always say it's different when it's your kid. Um, mm -hmm. But I knew the word PFLAG, so I dialed 1-800-PFLAG or there it was and I found it and I found you know the family that I have and have not left since. So I'm so interested, really, from both of you, from either of you, when you are working with other PFLAG families, what are some of the questions that they ask? You're going to your point that uh, families sometimes feel like they're sort of positioned in one way, politically or socially, and then maybe surprised about their own um, internal angst. Oh, 
Well, I, you know, it's interesting. The the uh, the 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 questions. It it's as we're talking now. Uh, one of the things you have to do is establish uh, a relationship of trust so that folks are comfortable even speaking. Um, you, you asked earlier about um, coming to PFLAG. I actually um, joined PFLAG um, because a, a, a good friend of mine um, actually um, solicited me to join the organization because they were at the time um, the group realized that there was a need to do more outreach to communities of color and that there was a desire to get um, individuals who could um, be voices to reach out to that community. And that resonated to me um, in a large way. And um, because I, I, I feel that that is something important for the community to be able to benefit from the resources that the organization has to offer. So first and foremost, um, you know, folks will ask um, at, at times um, about the confidentiality of mm -hmm. discussions, which mm -hmm. we, which, which uh, we do, we're able to provide. But I think um, once, there's an understanding and a comfort level that there will be that confidentiality, that you're not alone, that there are others who are similarly situated. That begins the dialogue to open the door um, of, of providing resources to help the family through what is a difficult um, journey for some. Um, and, uh, but again, it's, it's just opening the door of conversation and and showing that you have empathy to the the situation that the family is dealing with. I'm interested again if we go back to that idea that we read these, um, you know, what is family books, or we're reading books about anything, but early on they kind of present these narrow ideas of family. Um, as you begin to parent an openly queer or trans child, how did your parenting change? What were assumptions that you shed or new ways that you decided to engage your child? Well, one of the things that uh, we did was look for every single LGBTQ related book, movie, uh, production, event that we could find. Um, in those days, which was more than 10 years ago, it, it seemed like there wasn't that much. And so really, we ended up going to a lot of different PFLAG meetings in hopes that other families would, would bring their, were bringing their children so that my child could find friends. One of my kids' very first friends, I will never forget the day that that child, a, a child of someone uh, in, in PFLAG Los Angeles, came to our house with their makeup bag my kid's face lit up and it just, it was, you know, that's what it was in the very beginning, you know, more than a decade ago, it was going to PFLAG meetings because that's where the community and the resources and knowledge and friendships were. Yeah. How and about I, you, Robert? How did, what changed for you as a parent? Well, it, 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 uh, you know, it's, uh, you, you need to, um, ensure that you have, uh, a mindset of understanding and patience. Um, and it's also important to seek out allies and individuals who are similarly situated. And I was fortunate that I had uh, friends who I could who I could speak to. But the other thing um, that um, really um, shook me and it's really to be candid a, a concern to this date is um fear the safety of your of your child um and um concerns about um the the ignorance of others and um their their uh, unwillingness to accept your child as a human being and acting on that fear you talked about hate earlier so um, that leads you at times to do things with your child, which may be overbearing, and they don't understand 
the the nature of that interaction. So it's it it it, it causes you to take a step back, um, assess the manner in which you're interacting, um, ensuring that communication is critical, understanding at times you're not going to always get it right, and it's it's important to um, to persist and also work to build that trust with your child so that they are comfortable sharing their uh, concerns, their issues with you um, with a sense that you understand what they're what they're feeling. And I will just say that's an ongoing process. All right. I want to do a little speed round with y'all before we move out. And uh, I'm just going to ask you questions that are probably a little too hard for doing quickly, but let's just see what we could come up with. All right, so I'm gonna start with you, Gisela. Give me three words that describe family or what family means to you. Mm. <laughs> unconditional love, unconditional love, and unconditional love. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> no, I'll take them, I'll take them. How about you, Robert? Do you have three words, two or three words that describe your understanding of family? Sure, I was gonna say loving, empathy, and resilient. Mm. I like yeah. that. Um, so Gisela, you talked earlier about books and films. Is, is there one resource that you have repeatedly turned to as an ally? You know what, there is. Um, there is a, a Spanish movie called La Otra Familia that um, it, that contains two very famous Mexican move, male movie stars in a in a marriage in a same sex uh, marriage, and I often tell parents watch this movie over and over and over again and get used to two men kissing. Um, two women kissing, get used to it so that when your child brings their first partner home, you will be used to it. So um, that was it. A lot of movies, but mainly La Otra Familia, which I highly recommend to all um, Spanish speaking families because of the, uh, the, it breaks the stereotype of what a male uh, telenovela male movie star is. How about you, Robert? Do you have a book or a film? Actually, um, actually, I practice what I preach as a board member, and that's I, I often go to pflag.org. I mean, there there are um, enormous resources, and um, I go there and direct others to do the same. Okay, here's the very last question. If I had an opportunity to interview your child and I asked them to describe you in just a few words, three, four, five, how would they describe you? Robert, I'm gonna start with you. Um, loving, obtuse, <laughs> and supportive. Ah, good, I'll take those. How about you, Gisela? How would you, your child describe you? Um, I asked my kid last night and they said extra, unapologetic and hard-headed. Listen, there is no doubt that my child would also describe me as extra. So um, for all of the extra mamas out there, I will take it. Gisela Cesny of PFLAG in Espanol and Robert Marchman of PFLAG National. Thank you both for joining me for What Makes Pride. Thank you Thank again. you. appreciate the opportunity. Have Thank you. And up next, we have original music by Tomu DJ. Tomu DJ is an American producer and DJ best known for her groundbreaking self-released projects on Bandcamp. You can find and follow her work at Tomu DJ, that's T-O-M-U DJ, on all platforms. And then stick around after our music break, because I'm going to be talking with two more guests as we discuss queering AAPI families. <laughs> 